I am so thrilled, honored, awestruck. This is our first grandparent, and I can't ask for anybody more perfect to kick it off. Please give a warm welcome to Larry Gelbart. <clears throat> if I seem inept at public speaking, it might just be that after a marriage now in its second half century, I don't get... Thank you. I don't get to do a whole lot of private speaking either. <laughs> in any case, here are a few thoughts accumulated during the blink of a lifetime, a few observations accumulated while approaching the intersection where sunset runs into eternity. Not that time doesn't chiefly make you, at best, only a more experienced fool, but at long last I've divined that at least one part of life's grand design is largely a matter of give and take. That while the years take away your peers, they give you playmates instead. Suddenly you're provided with a set of new, vibrant, remorselessly curious friends, guys who are learning how to speak at exactly the same time as you're learning how not to hear. <laughs> Although that part is relatively easy for me, I simply pretend that whichever youngster is talking is just giving me script notes. <laughs> Obviously, therefore, the younger the child, the better. In terms of contemporary children, I find that innocence these days pretty much stops at conception. <laughs> it's no trick at all for today's toddlers to master computers while they're still in their soggy nappies. Imagine the advance in their education the first time they Google Puss in Boots. Or when they peek at the cable channel, we fell asleep watching and gorge themselves on programming that's best viewed while wearing a raincoat. <laughs> Their precautions this aside, I think of each of my grand and my great-grandkids in exactly the same way I used to think about their parents way back in the day before I became knee-high to them. Not that they've been put on earth merely for me to cuddle and to coddle, not that they're life-size dolls to be stuffed with affection or as victims of slobbery demonstrativeness long after they'd settle for a simple hug or a handshake. Of course they're precious, these mini mention that you'd lay your life down for, although there's not one of them you wouldn't wrestle to the death for possession of the last Oreo in the pack. <laughs> I think of them rather as time capsules, each the bearer of some portion of my personality, each a porter helping to lighten my emotional baggage. But I want to leave them something a whole lot more tangible. Proof, maybe. Proof that I, too, was young once, or at least younger. That I was not born a grandpa, that some smelly old Zadie has been using my body as a host. <laughs> just killing time inside me, an arthritic character actor waiting in the wings, just dying to make his entrance. That life on the senior circuit is not all merely CAT scans and turning to the obits before looking at the sports section. <laughs> How does one teach a young pup new tricks? After a Thanksgiving dinner some years ago, my then three-year-old granddaughter Nina asked me to tell her a story. Even before she told me what it was she wanted to hear, I knew the one it was going to be. If I got a, sec a check from SAG every time I recited the three bears, it would surely add up to a million dollars. I'm talking a million a bear. <laughs> Not having a child's tolerance, more like a child's need for repetition, I decided that this time I'd indulge in a bit of rewriting as I told her what for me had long become a fairy tale on a loop. Once upon a time I started off, that was the kind of bear trap I set for her, there was a family who lived in the woods, I said, a family that was made up of a daddy bear, a mommy bear, and a little baby pig. <laughs> Nina looked at me sharply. She didn't know quite what was happening. The truth was, I wasn't all that sure myself. When I asked her if she wanted me to go on, she shook her head yes, kind of, sort of. One day I went on, waiting for their porridge to cool off. The family went for a walk. 
And while they were gone, a little girl who was lost stumbled upon their cottage and wandered inside. She was very, very beautiful, with long golden curls, and her name was Snow White. <laughs> Nina took a real hard look at me. Grandpa, she said, Grandpa, you're making me very nervous. I said, you want me to give it to you straight, or you want me to give it to you nervous? Without missing a beat, she said, give it to me nervous. I suppose that if I have a single legacy to stand on, it's that I've always tried to make language a game for the young ones around me. Always encourage them to use it as a form of lingual Lego. Happily, some kids have no need for instruction in the matter at all. When my wife told our three oldest that she and their father were divorcing and that she was going to marry me, their very first question had to do with what I should be called. I offered them two choices. They could call me Dad or they could call me Larry, whichever made them feel more comfortable. Kathy, who was eight, settled for Larry. Gary, six, said he would try dad for a while. Paul, then four, thought about it for a moment. When he finally spoke, he said, I think I'll call you Betty. <laughs> forget the improv, forget the comedy store. To this day, the funniest room I know is still the one where the whole brood gathers for dinner every Monday night. It's the one place where I'm guaranteed to be entertained, not by stand-up comics, but by my own sit-down progeny, whose company is as wry and as dry as the most demanding palate might require. I've known a great many children in my time, dozens of them if you include the altitude challenge leading men I work with. <laughs> There's not one kid who hasn't taught me some sort of valuable lesson. The chief one, without question, that I'm a far, far better grandpa than I ever was a dad, or even a Larry, or for that matter, a Betty, God help me. <laughs> without my knowledge, and certainly without my permission, time, which has nothing but itself on its hands, has been sneaking up behind my back and given me a patience I never before could spare, or even suspected that I possessed. The score to date is pretty even. I have succeeded or failed at everything I've ever sought to attain with an odd, almost perverse pride and greater affection for the failures. My heydays fast becoming as much of a memory as my hay nights. My taste for vices is finally sated. sated. Hard to say, harder to do. <laughs> Not only have any number of former fires been banked they are no longer even drawing any interest. Fantasies once transformed into realities reduce the expectation that so often acts as foreplay for regret. New cataracts have replaced the old stars in my eyes. My vanity, my immodesty on hold, my ego finally on the diet it should have gone on years ago, I've learned that secretly coveted awards and honors enrich only the makers of metal polishes. Best of all, I no longer have to be any place that doesn't turn out to be exactly wherever it is I am. And increasingly, that is in the company of those who call me Ganka, a name bestowed upon me by a grandchild who could never pronounce the word grandpa. Grandfather itself, a title I always thought better suited for tall clocks and legal clauses. Whatever I am to whoever I am, I have become a Plato Picasso a king of the crayons, one who is equally adept at drawing rocket ships and backyard treasure maps as he is at sketching mythical characters like dragons or powerful, menacing aliens like Daleks and moms and dads. Would I like to be younger? Would I like to start over, do it all again? I can do that absolutely any time I feel that way. All I have to do is pick up the phone and volunteer to babysit. Thank you.